this point, it's a great pleasure to introduce Sylvie Laperriere, um, a builder of the global internet. She leads the Africa Global Network Acquisition Team at Google and was previously an interconnection strategist for Google's peering, caching, and cloud. A recognized leader, Sylvie has been involved in the governance of nonprofit tech organizations, having chaired the board of directors of two internet exchanges, AMSIX and the Montreal Exchange, and she volunteered for five years here at Nanog. She chairs the board of directors of Canada's Advanced Research and Innovation Network and serves on the College du Rocher Saint Hubert Education Board of Directors. Sylvie promotes diverse talent inclusion by coaching and mentoring young ICT professionals and promoting science and technology careers with teenagers and underrepresented groups. A proud mother of three, inspiring young adults, she enjoys the company of friends and family, reading, hiking, discovering the world, and meeting new people. And Montreal is her hometown from birth. We are delighted that she will be talking to us this morning about developing the internet during a pandemic, and her experiences building a submarine cable during a pandemic, all without any travel. Sylvie, please come to the stage. And there's the remote. Good luck. Bonjour Montréal. Bonjour Nanog. Bienvenue à Montréal. You should all be familiar with this greeting by now. Parlez-vous français? No. Anglais? Si. Si? English? Franglish? So if you can muster some Franglish, you will feel right at home here in Montreal. So as Fergus said, I was born, raised and educated in Montreal, and it's been my gateway to the world. Uh, my starting point in the international telecommunication journey and Nanog, uh, I started my career in 1993 as a young grad at Teleglobe Canada. Uh, in 1996, I launched AS6453, which you probably recognize. In 2013, I co-founded KIX, the Montreal Internet Exchange, a proud sponsor today. Uh, so Nanog and me. Uh, I got involved with Nanog the first time was 2003. I attended nine, Nanog 30 in Miami. And then um, I have to admit, you're an intimated, intimi intimidating bunch. It took me nine nanogs to muster the courage to put a presentation together. And I presented at Nanog 39 in Toronto on the Taiwan earthquake uh, cable cuts. Uh, and then I got involved. I felt, I felt some comfort here in exchanging ideas as a healthy place for a debate, and I decided that I should try to lead the change from the inside. So I wanted more representation in Nanog, so I had to advocate what I preached, and I got involved. So I joined the program committee, and then uh, the board of directors, and I've attended, I don't know, I think, probably around 14 nanogs, but I'm sure one of you in this room will be able to keep me straight. So, building networks during a pandemic, what could possibly have changed? Everything. So before the pandemic, the, my way of doing things, or I guess my team's way of doing things, uh, we were going on site. We were developing relationships. So there was a lot of traveling involved. Um, definitely, probably more than my body could sustain, but it was part of the job. Now, during the pandemic, my world completely changed. I was at home 24 seven, and I think for more than 800 days. And I felt some loneliness. I also felt some powerlessness. I felt that everything was a struggle, difficult. Talking to people had to be booked, programmed. A water cooler conversation 
had to be an event in my calendar so that I could connect. So I, I felt unconnected. And my job is to connect the world, but I personally felt unconnected. However, my sense of purpose was intact, and that, that kept me going. So I'm here to um, talk to you about Google's network infrastructure investments in the, on the African continent, more specifically, the Equiano Cable. Announced in June 2019, Equiano is the next generation subsea internet cable that will ultimately run from Portugal to South Africa along the Atlantic coast of Africa. The initial configuration of the cable system include landings in Lome, Togo, Lagos, Nigeria, the largest African economy, Cape Town in South Africa, the continent's most advanced economy, and Swakopmund, Namibia. The cable has already made several landings. I'll shed some light on that later. And it's expected to go live by the end of this year. In this presentation, I want to highlight why Africa is so central to Google's plans to get to the next billion users online. As many of you probably know, the continent is the most underserved in terms of internet infrastructure, with penetration and uptake of online technology and services lagging behind other regions. For many people around the world, Africa evokes images of poverty, famine, or conflict. In other words, major challenges. While it's true that the continent continues to face challenges, this perspective masks much of the reality on the ground. In the tech and connectivity spheres in particular, We've seen exponential growth in investments from local and international players like Google in recent years. These investments are having a transformative impact on the continent, accelerating sustainable economic growth, creating much needed jobs, and creating the right conditions for the continent to flourish. Africa is no longer a continent we can ignore. Its population is set to almost double by 2050. That's only 30 years, when a quarter of the world's people will be African. Its economy is expanding quicker than anywhere else. Its innovation and venture capital system is growing at a record rate, underpinned by young and growing pool of professional developers. After setting the scene and explaining why Africa is already so important and will become even more important in the coming years. I'll shed some light on Equiano, what it does, who it serves, and what milestones we've already reached. So why, sorry, I should have moved to this slide. Why Africa? Firstly, it's important to remember that Africa is not a country it's a continent of 54 countries, each with their own culture, history, economy, states of development, and levels of stability. And each of them offer different opportunities. The continent is often painted with a broad brush, but there are immense variations between Africa's countries. There's a huge difference between Nigeria the largest economy with a population of 200 million people, centered around the economic capital and powerhouse that is Lagos, and the continent's six island states that have combined population of less than 30 million people. Likewise, there's a huge difference between Togo and Nigeria, two countries where Equiano is landing, that are separated only by 50 kilometers but with a different language and different economy. From an internet connectivity perspective, Sub-Saharan Africa remains the most underserved region in terms of internet infrastructure. Penetration stands at 32%, while for the entire continent, including North Africa, it's at 40%. By contrast, internet penetration by population in the US and in North America 
is around 90%. Across the continent, a significant share of the population lives without internet access that is fast, reliable, cheap, and of good quality. In other words, something we all here at Nanog take for granted and have taken for granted well over a decade. Or actually, I should say, we have worked hard well over a decade. From this, there's a clear need to invest in network infrastructure, to boost connectivity across the continent and get more people online. More importantly, the continent's need for improved connectivity is also based on future gap. Let me show you these. Africa is home to 1.3 billion people, or currently 16% of the global population. Of the 20 fastest growing countries in the world, 19 are in Africa. Projections indicate that 87% population growth in Africa between 2020 and 2050 will result in a total population of 2.5 billion. The African continent is demographically young. 60% of the population will be under 24 years of age by 2025. And Africa will be home to one in three youth globally by 2050. In parallel, Africa is experiencing rapid urbanization with 68 cities, each home to over 1 million people. In 2020, the number of such cities is projected to increase by 285 by 2025 in three years. Some countries, Nigeria, Ghana, and Angola among them, will see the proportion of urban residents increase to over 80% of their total population by 2050, when 800 million more Africans will have moved to urban areas in addition, there's been a general improvement in life expectancy as Sub-Saharan Africans are expected to, to live nearly six years longer than a decade ago. What does this all mean? Simply put, these positive trends suggest a higher adoption of digital services in Africa in the future. In other words, many of the next billion users to come online in the coming years will be from Africa. What do these demographic trends mean for Africa's economy? The answer is that Africa's demographic boom fuels consumption. Young Africans' consumers are becoming more affluent and globalized as they also grow to become household decision makers. This boosts the continent's competitiveness in both skilled and unskilled labor and will lead to increased spending, increased spending power for consumers. By 2030, Africa is expected to be home to over 1.7 billion consumers with total consumer expenditures of 2.5 trillion. These trends are already at work. Africa's economy has expanded significantly over the last decade and an average faster and on average faster than most other region. After years of negotiation, the African Continental Free Trade Area, FCFT FCFTA, came into effect in January 2021. It's the world's largest free trade area by number of members, covering 1.3 billion individuals across 54 countries, with a combined GDP of $3.4 trillion. As I said earlier, we can no longer ignore the African continent. At Google, we are bullish about the Afri Africa's future. And that's why we're investing today, to bring more people online and broaden access to digital services. Google is by no means the only international tech company or backbone operator doing this. Over the last few years, we've seen groundswell interest of an investment by African and international investors, 
a few merit attention. Facebook, Meta, is spearheading a consortium of network operators and telcos to build a submarine cable called To Africa that will encircle the African continent and should go live in 2024. Last year, Equinix announced it was acquiring Main One, a pioneering Nigerian company that operates a submarine cable along the west coast of Africa, as well as a leading West African data center business. In January of this year, Digital Realty announced the acquisition of Terraco, Africa's largest colocation provider. By 2025, the internet economy has the potential to contribute 180 billion to Africa's economy, growing to 700 and 12 billion by 2050. COVID-19 delayed growth in both Africa as well as the rest of the world. However, the resilience of the internet economy, coupled with private consumption, strong developer talent, public and private investment, investments in digital infrastructure, and new government policies and regulations will continue to drive this growth for Africa. Submarine cables are, an integral, are integral to bridging connectivity gaps and accelerating digital transformation. They are the world's information superhighways and form the cornerstone of the internet. They carry an estimated 97% of global international communications and 10 trillion in daily financial transactions. The remainder of international traffic is satellite-based. High-speed, high-capacity connections underpinned by submarine infrastructure are central to today's hyper-connected global economy. Cables enable high-quality video streaming and conferencing, international phone calls, and support the growth of cloud computing. Significant investments and partnerships along the entire value chain can boost connectivity, increase internet penetration, reduce prices, and improve quality of service to end users. Submarine cables, while not the only factor, are central to unlocking Africa's digital potential and narrowing the digital divide between the continent and more connected regions. The vast majority of online content consumed in Africa is hosted in data centers outside the continent, with submarine cables transporting data between users and data centers through a vast complex value chain. Africa faces fine ma main challenges at this, on all stages of the value chain. Data centers are predominantly located outside Africa, meaning content for users on the continent has to travel far via international submarine cables or expensive satellite links. Existing and as a matter of fact, you can fit three times the continental US into the continent of Africa, if you look it up on a map, just to give you a sheer idea of size. Existing submarine cables are aging and typically rely on older technology, while many countries lack redundancy. Existing subsea infrastructure will be unable to meet the rising demand for international bandwidth in the coming years. Edge locations on the continent are not yet fully developed, meaning content has to travel further to end users, increasing cost and access and latency. New and, new and existing internet exchange points need to grow to ensure content is hosted locally and traffic is routed efficiently. Middle mile infrastructure is underdeveloped despite strong growth in recent years. Internet access networks are not sufficiently dense or developed to provide universal access. Currently, 25% of Africa's population does not live within the footprint of a mobile broadband network. Boosting submarine connectivity will not solve all these problems. However, submarine infrastructure is central to connectivity in Africa and around the world. The first map here is showing you 
Africa's terrestrial and submarine fibers. You can see that many areas are under development. And the second map shows the African countries by number of cable landings. The darkest one is 12 cables, and that's Egypt, where most uh, cables go through the Suez Canal. And you see the whitish area on the map are the landlocked, unconnected country by submarine cables, obviously. And the gray ones are those with only one cable. So what's Equiano? Equiano is a next generation subsea uh, internet cable spearheaded by Google that will run from Portugal to South Africa along the Atlantic coast of Africa. Its planned landings are Lome in Togo, Lagos, Nigeria, Swakopmund, Namibia, Cape Town, South Africa, and Rupert's Bay in St. Helena, with branching units in place for a second phase of the project. Last year, the cable landed in Rupert's Bay, St. Helena. Earlier this year, the cable landed in Lome, in Lisbon, and Lagos. From a technical perspective, Equiano cable is the first subsea cable to incorporate optical switching at the pair level, at the fiber pair level rather than the traditional approach of wavelength level switching. Equiano will also be the first spatial division multiplex cable deployed along this route, allowing for a greater design capacity of 144 terabit per second. So why did Google decide to invest in Equiano? Our decision was based on five factors. Africa is home to over 20 submarine cables, some of which began operations almost 20 years ago and are nearing the end of their life cycles. Equiano is a state-of-the-art cable that leverages next-generation technology to provide significantly more capacity than the last set of cables built to serve the continent. Africa's growing a rapidly growing population and internet user base combined with more intensive use of the internet means that the current submarine cables will be unable to meet demand beyond the next few years. Investing today means we are well prepared to serve tomorrow's users. Better performance. Low latency forms the cornerstone of good user experience. That's our mission in this room. The increased uh, the increased bandwidth will bring to Africa more latency-sensitive products to function and to be developed. And last and fourth one is redundancy. Africa currently has relatively few submarine cables connecting to other geographies, as you've seen on the map, sometimes only one. The majority of countries that are served by only one or two cable is astounding. As outlined in the cables, in the case study, when cables are damaged, when they break, or when they undergo repairs, it means that users will definitely suffer uh, through the disruptions. Building new cables will improve consistency and resiliency. Creating diverse and scalable paths to reach more users. As part of the construction design, Several branching units are placed already for, on the seafloor for, for a second phase. By having more control over the design, construction, and upgrade, Google will be able to quickly deploy additional branches to bring more contents to, closer to users. This is a project built on partnerships. While we're spearheading the construction of the Aquiano cable, other partners, namely wholesale network providers, are able to use and benefit from the cable's additional capacity. We do not directly provide broadband or mobile access to end users, but instead partners with multiple key uh, telecom players, such as telcos or infrastructure operators, where Equiano lands to ensure that the cable's capacity benefits the most users and the most businesses uh, across the continent. Now, we wanted to measure the impact of this investment. 
So we commissioned Afri Africa Practice and Genesis Analytics to produce a series of economic impact assessments for the countries where Equiano will land. The impact metrics are based on robust economic and econometric studies using historical data where possible. I'm going to use here Togo as a case study to highlight Equiano's economic impact because Togo has put in place some excellent policies to attract investments in the digital sphere and to accelerate digital growth and digital transformation. It's one of the continent's leaders in this regard. The increase in international bandwidth capacity following the landing is expected to have an immediate impact on average IP transit prices, on speeds and on latency. For end users in Togo, this will translate to cheaper and more reliable internet access, leading to a substantial growth in user in traffic and internet penetration. The cost of long haul transmission of data is a major determinant of local IP transit prices. Equiano's landing in Togo will create a new high speed route for international data transmission. The cable's lower installation costs relative to its design capacity, as well as increased competition for the long haul transmission of data, will lead to lower IP transit prices. In turn, lower IP transit prices could be passed on to consumers through decreases in their internet prices or indirectly through the provision of more data, uncapped data limits, or higher speeds at the same price. The increased international bandwidth capacity means that more data can be transmitted to Togo within a particular time frame. This will translate into faster internet speeds and lower latency, particularly with regard to non-cacheable content and the area of close, in the areas in close proximities to terrestrial fiber optic cables. Lower prices combined with improved speeds and latency are expected to increase internet penetration in Togo by 5.1% percentage points between 2021 and 2025. Faster internet speeds will lead to a higher demand in data traffic. In parallel, lower internet retail prices will increase internet usage both extensively by enabling new users to get online for the first time, as well as new ways of using the internet for the existing users, and intensively by enabling existing users to consume more data. Summering cables impact on speeds and prices can catalyze investments by ISPs and infrastructure providers, thereby expanding the ter terrestrial networks. Specifically, lower IP transit prices following the landing of such cables as Equiano or to Africa will improve it ISP's bottom lines, enabling them to invest in the expansion of their networks to reach new customers in the middle mile. In parallel, greater demand and usage of the internet following Equiano's landing is also expected to increase ISP's revenue, in inducing the expansion of their networks. Internet capacity unlocks significant economic opportunities, more so in developing countries than other developed parts. A landmark study by the International Telecom Union in 2019 found that in Africa, a 10% increase in mobile internet penetration increases GDP per capita by 2.5%. Improved connectivity and higher internet penetration unlock significant opportunities for individuals, for businesses, and for governments. In Togo, the digital economy can be a real game changer for the country's economy and society. It represents an opportunity to accelerate growth, to industrialize, to innovate, and to improve people's lives. Crucially, 
It offers a pathway to, diversity, to diversify the economy away from ag agriculture, which has historically been the dominant sector. On the employment front, Equiano is expected to indirectly create 36,870 new jobs between 2022 and 2025, driven by the growth of the digital economy and the telecom sector. So in conclusion, Togo is a small country with a population of 8 million people. But if you look at Nigeria, for example, Equiano is expected to indirectly create 1.6 million jobs between 2022 and 2025. In Nigeria and in South Africa, real GDP will be boosted to 10.1 billion, respectively, and 7 billion higher than it would otherwise have been. These are truly, truly transformative impacts and something that we're very proud. But as I've mentioned throughout this presentation, realizing Africa's digital potential requires partnerships. It also requires partnerships across the value chain and significant investments. The companies that take note of Africa's demographic, economic, and commercial potential today will be best positioned to capture tomorrow's opportunities. I will now show you some cool images of building the Equiano cable. It turns out a big part of the cloud isn't in the sky. It takes the form of fiber optic cables like this that crisscross the globe. And Google has one of the most advanced global networks of fiber optic cables. Our subsea cables are carefully laid on the ocean floor. Compared to satellites, submarine cables are able to provide much higher bandwidth and low latency, which means less delay for users when they're using video streaming, cloud services, and financial transactions. Connecting people and places is at the heart of what we do at Google. We don't just want to organize the world's information, but we need to make it universally accessible, which means we need to connect everyone on the planet. Teams all over the world collaborate to stretch our network fabric through an enormous feat of partnership, physics, and engineering. Google's network operates like a mesh. Our organization focuses on creating solutions that interconnect humanity, and that's really the purpose of our network. Our highest priority is to create a network that society can depend on. Thank you. So building in a pandemic posed a ton of challenges, mainly communication challenges between partners, not being able to do face-to-face -face meetings or in-person meetings across different languages, different cultures is difficult. It's, um, we, we were, however, able to manage to keep the schedule of Equiano rather on time um, there's only 90 days delay on a project that is three and a half years. So we, we really deployed treasures of ingenuity to make it happen, uh, especially shipping, um, shipping in, in this logistics environment. So we had to resort to every platform, every communication platform that you all built. I have accounts on about everything. I'm able to reach partners on every platform they want, they need. It was uh, definitely required. Uh, I have to say though, that during all of our communications with African partners, oftentimes the video part would not work because the bandwidth is too constrained. And that increases the challenge of communicating as human beings. 
I'm extremely proud of the Googlers teamwork and their relentless dedication to building the partnerships needed for this cable in the past three and a half years under really dire conditions. I'm also extremely grateful for the commitment and resolve demonstrated by all Equiano partners in St. Helena, in Togo, in Portugal, in Nigeria, in Namibia, and South Africa, and also our cable builder, ASN. And now for the non-technical and probably unsolicited advice, uh, takeaways uh, during the pandemic, I'll leave you with this. Nanog is a great, great community. And you get what you put in. So you get what you give. So I would say pay it forward. Make sure that you contribute to this wonderful community. It is so nice to meet in person after so many years. And this is a community of caring colleagues. And also some are now my friends for life. And you know who you are. So I would say get involved. It's the best way to connect to others and the best way to ensure that the internet continues to be the thriving place that it is. Um, in, the internet is not just routers, switches, and machine. I think it's firstly all of you. It's the people that make it. It's the people that connect those machines. And it's the people that take the time to come to conferences and share their knowledge to build this internet. So my challenge to you is to nurture your connections. When I was chair of NANOG, I would call it the challenge 15. And I've I would encourage everyone to meet at least 15 new people. We are all really, really insecure introverts, I would say, most of us. So you're in company of good friends. So go out, reach out, and connect to 15. And now I'm going to add my COVID tax. I'm going to ask you to reach out to five more. You still have two days to make 20 more connections. Those you made yesterday, they don't count. So you go and meet with 15 more plus five. That's my COVID tax. And also make sure that whenever you look at what you do and how you choose, where you choose to prioritize your work and your energy, go for impact. Go for meaning. Go for something that when you wake up in the morning, you go, this is what I'm meant to be doing with my day to day. So thank you. And take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks. So, thank you so much, Sylvie. That was fabulous. Do we have any questions from the room? Come, please, no, please go and queue at the microphones and then we'll... And just a reminder, name and affiliation, please. Uh, hello, my name is Andrei Sherbovich. I'm from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. So, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, ask you about... Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to... Uh, Thank you for your excellent uh, contribution for the world connectivity and uh, uh, I'd like to ask if this project is uh, coordinated or supported by global organizations or United Nations or UNDP or something like that. Or maybe you are in partnership with them because the bridging digital divide is one of their goals as well to maintain sustainable development. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your question. First, I'll pass your congratulations to the Googlers who work really hard on this. Um, this is one thing, not, nothing, nothing happens without teamwork. So there's a really big team working on that. I'll make sure that they get your recognition. Thank you for that. Uh, in terms of funding, this cable was funded by uh, private funds. It was fu uh, funded by Google. There was no uh, external support. Um, but we are looking at multiple ways of investment. So private is one, uh, consortium is another, 
um, having funders is yet another. So we're very open to working in many different ways to support these infrastructure projects. Yes. Oh, you have. Well, no, we'll, we'll do. Okay. Uh, I'm Adair. I'm from Internet too. All right. I'm short. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay. Yes, um, it is okay. Why? Let's go for the first one. Comparatively, why was there such a low speed increase projected in Namibia? Roughly the same as uh, South Africa. So Namibia would be uh, comparable to South Africa in terms of internet speeds. So it will, um, actually you can find this report online. We have published an economic impact. It will nearly double. And I think it's 41% decrease in cost. Okay. And um, why are there so many subsea cables that land in Djibouti and not the surrounding countries? Ah, excellent question. Um, submarine cables are particular beasts. They like good landings. They don't like rocky spots. They don't like um, shallow waters. Uh, so, um, and they don't like areas where there's increased fishing activities because anchors of uh, fishing boats might snap the cables. So landings are selected carefully to avoid basically human activities. But as you can tell, it's very hard to avoid all human activities. So we compose with constraints, uh, but Djibouti is one of those locations where uh, it's amenable. You're welcome. Um, we have a question from the chat from Tony Tauber, uh, sorry, from Tony, oh, there's two questions. One from Tony Tauber at Comcast. Maybe it was touched on and I missed it. Will a partner be doing the operations and maintenance of these subsea systems? I don't know what's typical. That's yes. two questions, really. Thank you. So, yes, um, there will be a, there's a few consort uh, a few companies that do repairs and maintenance of submarine cables. Uh, they're uh, typically associations and they will cover uh, an ocean. Um, so we're, we're in discussions with uh, some of these uh, providers to find uh, the provider that will service the cable for the next 15 years. Um. Hey, um, Gabe Blanchard from start.ca. Salut Sylvie. Bonjour Gabriel. Um, I'm just curiosity. I know Sylvie, you always work on really big projects. What's your next big thing you can share? I can. Can you speak closer big to project the mic? And share. You, uh, Sylvie, you always work on very large projects like Kix, Nanog, you know, this really big one. What's your next big thing? My next big thing is to continue. So my personal aspiration is to bring the internet infrastructure in Africa to the same level or at par with North America and Europe. So I do have a 10 year plan ahead of me. Okay, and we have a question from Tony Lee. Um, we're all familiar with DWDM technology. Can you please say a bit more about the optical switching technology that Equiana is using? Yes, so it's a uh, fiber pair switching. Um, I will link a note. We've published a few uh, white papers on it. Uh, so we're able to switch the fiber pairs as opposed to go on a spectrum basis. Okay. Um, Doug Midori Kentick. Um, hi, Sylvie. Hi. So uh, years ago, I used to attend a lot of submarine cable conferences. And I remember there would always be a panel on building in Africa in particular. And I remember one a few, couple years ago where there was a lot of concern uh, specifically, I think from Chris Wood, Chris Wood of uh, of Wyok, um, had expressed concern about overbuilding submarine cable capacity before access layer uh, or last mile is ready to absorb it, where you'd kind of take out the market for. I mean, obviously, he's more concerned maybe than Google is for uh, making payroll, but uh, you could. The concern is you could overbuild submarine cable before the access layer is. is has that, any of that changed? Is that still a concern? It is not. Uh, as you can see, what's changed is uh, the gaps, the demographic gaps and the connectivity gaps that I've explained. So just the, the population dividend will be so large in the next 20 years that 
with Equiano and to Africa, it won't be enough. We will need to start planning a new cable probably by year 10. So just think of 1.3 billion users to 2.5 billion users, 25% of the world's labor force, uh, in a in a context of digital transformation, I don't think we will have a glut of uh, internet capacity the same way that we've had a glut in the Atlantic in the mid nineties. Okay, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Um, question from Brian Gladney: um, Could you please restate estimated bandwidth with Equiano? I believe I missed it. It's 12 fiber pairs of roughly 12 terabit per second. So currently a 144 terabit per second. And as your SLTE equipment increases or increases capacity, you'll be able to increase that capacity as well. Um, question at the back, I think. Hi, this is Sumit from Tata Communication. A question like I'm seeing like a lot of developments being done for the South Africa. Uh, any plan for direct connectivity from South Africa to the Asia Pacific, like India, Singapore, and those countries? I didn't hear. Um, Can you repeat, please? Come closer yeah. a little. Could you come closer and perhaps? Okay. And so, any question, any cables uh, which Google is planning for connecting uh, South Africa with the Asia Pacific countries, like Singapore, India, and like direct connectivity? That sounds like a wonderful opportunity to explore. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, there's a couple of other comments that people have made in the Q&A which people might want to read, but they're not really questions. Do we have any other questions? I think we can call that a bit of wrap. Thank you so much, Sylvie. You're so welcome, and thank you. Bonjour. A bientôt. However... However... <laughs> We're now going to go off script and surprise Sylvie because she doesn't know about this bit. Uh, uh, no, we're not doing this. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I didn't get given the whole script, obviously. Um, you might like to go and talk to those two wonderful oh, gentlemen in the corner vous over there. Deux, là, vous deux. Oh, qu'est-ce que vous faites là? I think you're meant to go and talk to them over there. Oh, so right. um, I'll, I'm going to say I got Fantastic. that wrong. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And I haven't met 15 plus 5, so I'm looking forward to meet you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs>